everybody, welcome back to NeuroSciQ, the best place on YouTube to increase your neuroscience IQ. If you're new to the channel, thanks for joining us. Make sure you subscribe for weekly neuroscience videos. And if you're a returning visitor, thanks for coming back and supporting the channel. As you may know, in light of the current pandemic, there have been new bylaws put into place all across Ontario, all across Canada and the United States, and even worldwide that implement the use of masks. In fact, it has become the law to wear masks inside public places and public vehicles all across Ontario. The reason we're doing this is in hopes to fight the spread of COVID-19, but of course with new regulations as always come backlash from the public. And so there are arguments that wearing masks can actually be detrimental to your health and cause a lack of oxygen that can be damaging. But just last week, a doctor actually ran 22 miles wearing a mask to prove that it can be done and to prove that it didn't lower his blood oxygen levels. He took readings across the whole run and his blood oxygen level didn't decrease, even though he was wearing a face mask. So what do we believe? Are masks good for you or are they gonna cause hypoxia? And if they do cause hypoxia, what happens to the brain when we experience a lack of oxygen? In today's episode, we're going to discuss the effects of hypoxia on the brain, and then we're going to touch on whether or not face masks can actually cause such a concern. So sit tight, stay tuned, let's roll the intro. On July 7th, 2020, it became the law to wear face masks or a face covering of some sort inside public areas. And this was a law that was created in the city of Toronto and it has also been implemented in other cities across Ontario. On July 29th, the bylaw actually increased saying that masks must be worn in all public areas, including condo buildings as well. Now, this doesn't include somebody's own condo, but in public areas shared by the condominium. With these new laws come a fight and resistance from people in the public that don't want to wear masks. There's also claims saying that masks can cause problems in oxygen levels, and this can be more concerning for our health than the pandemic. So let's look at what this Center for Disease Control says. The Center for Disease Control suggests that masks should not be worn by children under the age of two, people that have trouble breathing, people that are unconscious, incapacitated, or unable to remove the mask without assistance. Why would we have such rules in place? Well, for young kids, sometimes wearing a mask can become even more harmful as they're little and they always are going to be touching their face to make adjustments. This could be even worse than having them without the mask. But for people that have trouble breathing, people that are unconscious, incapacitated, or can't remove the mask without assistance, we don't want to put a mask on them in case it does cause an issue. If they feel like their airway is being blocked and they can't remove the mask, that becomes problematic. And if you go on to the Center for Disease Control and you look at their website, there is actually a list of times when wearing a mask is not feasible. And this includes when you are infected with COVID-19. They say, don't even bother, just don't leave the house. It's too risky even if you have a mask on. Also, if you're helping somebody with COVID-19, a homemade mask might not necessarily be enough to stop the spread if you know they have COVID-19. It also says for people that have trouble breathing, including people with chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and other similar diseases, wearing a mask is not feasible. But for those of us that are healthy, wearing a mask can help us do our part to fight the spread of COVID-19. There's a lot of arguments saying there's not enough proof that masks can actually help, but there have been studies that look into this already. 
And the New England Journal of Medicine actually published a letter to the editor that helped people visualize droplets as people speak. So what this experiment did was look at individuals speaking with a face mask or without a face mask. And so without the face mask, they spoke and there was a laser light that would pick up the water droplets. With the face mask, it completely blocked these droplets from being visualized. The study was done using a damp washcloth to stimulate the face mask. It would have been nice if they did it with actual face masks so we could see the effect, but it helps to get the point across. You can see when people speak, there are these little invisible water droplets and aerosols that get into the air. Now, there was also another test done in 2013 and it was titled Testing the Efficiency of Homemade Masks Would They Protect in an Influenza Pandemic? Now, this is one that is a great study because people are being encouraged to even wear homemade masks if that's all they have. And so, while surgical masks were found to be three times more effective than homemade masks, they were still functional, but obviously not 100%. This study also looked at microorganism transmission, not virus transmission, and so it might not cross over as well as we would like, but we can see that homemade masks are effective even though they're not as effective as surgical masks. And in fact, there is the list, it goes N95 masks, surgical masks, and then homemade masks. Another study that was published in Nature Medicine just this year looked at N95 masks and the transmission of viruses. The first thing the researchers did was look at viral shedding. So this was done using a nasal swab or a throat swab, which would help detect how much shedding of the virus was happening. And so as we can see with the nasal swab, we see a lot more viral shedding versus the throat swab. And this is just in terms of how much RNA gets picked up from a nasopharyngeal swab or from a throat swab. Then they looked at the patients in 30 minute intervals. And so they looked at them without a mask on and saw that there was viral RNA detected in the air. And then with the mask on, it dropped down to zero in terms of how much RNA was in the sample. This was seen both for droplets and for aerosols. So the mask did effectively block the spread of the corona RNA in droplets as well as in aerosols. So they looked not only at coronavirus, but they also looked at the influenza virus and the rhinovirus and saw similar results for all of these. So wearing a mask does reduce the amount of viral RNA in air droplets and aerosols. So we see that masks are effective, but yet people still don't want to wear them. And why don't we want to wear it? Are we actually suffering when we take the mask and put it on for the hour or even less that we are spending in the grocery store? So normally our oxygen levels in our blood should be at around 95 to 100%. Our carbon dioxide levels should be at around 23 to 29 milliequivalents per liter of blood. And carbon dioxide is important because it actually relates to the pH of our blood as well. So a 2010 study looked at F95 face masks and they saw that it can reduce the oxygen and increase the CO2 levels. This is because we are rebreathing our carbon dioxide. But physiologically, the impact was not significant. So even though these individuals were rebreathing carbon dioxide and maybe getting a little less oxygen, the people that were participating in the study did not show a physiological impact. What the scientists did mention was that the air that they were breathing from inside their mask was actually not to the standards of the Occupational Safety and Health Administrator standards for workplaces. So the oxygen levels and carbon dioxide levels were not met to standard. In fact, the carbon dioxide was too high and the oxygen was too low. But when we're in public, this is not likely to be a concern, considering that the people in the test were studied over hours and showed no physiological impact. Us going into a grocery store or going into a public space 
for a little while and having to wear a mask isn't going to kill us. Now, what happens to your brain if you're having low oxygen? Now, if you're suffocating and you have not enough oxygen to feed the cells in your brain, that's when brain damage can happen. But when you're in a state of hypoxia or low oxygen, but you're still getting oxygen to your blood, our body does something amazing, and that's called acclimatization. So the state of wearing a face mask could be similar if we want to make an analogy to the state that you'd be in if you were at a high altitude. Now I'm not talking like the top of Mount Everest, but I'm talking maybe a little higher than sea level. Our bodies are amazing and they can change when there's different levels of oxygen in the environment. In fact, our lungs respond. And the neurons in our lungs actually sense the different pressure of oxygen in the alveoli and they signal our brain to alter ventilation. So there's this afferent input. Afferent input goes from sensors to the brain that tells our brain that we're getting a little less oxygen and then it changes the output from the brain to our lungs to change our breathing. So our lungs respond, but since this is a neuroscience channel, we want to talk about what happens to the brain. The brain can experience hypoxic depression. And so if you're experiencing headaches or dizziness while wearing a mask, it might be a good idea to try and get out of the public space, take off your mask and get some more air. Hypoxic depression is when your central nervous system isn't getting enough oxygen and so the neurons can't function as well as usual. And so this kind of makes people feel drunk. It leads to poor decision making and in the American Medical Research Expedition to Everest, they saw that individuals had abnormal cognitive functioning at high altitudes and their ability to perform repetitive fast movements was inhibited. So this lack of oxygen can cause a little bit of a blur in our mind as our cells need the oxygen to function. But what we want to talk about is how our brain adapts to less oxygen. There's this thing called ventilatory acclimatization to hypoxia. And this is when we acclimatize to low oxygen levels. Hypoxia means low oxygen. Hypercapnia means high carbon dioxide. So at high altitudes, we tend to have less oxygen. And these low oxygen levels cause neuroplastic changes that accommodate and increase our breathing. The first time I actually learned about this was in a human physiology class. And I was thinking about it a lot when people were talking about wearing masks. How our body has all these sensors to sense the different levels of oxygen in the environment and change our breathing to help us accommodate for the levels. Now within our corroded artery, that is right here in our neck, leads to the brain and it supplies the brain, neck and face with blood. It's the major artery that you can feel pulsing if you ever check your pulse using your neck instead of your thumb. But basically, this corroded artery supplies our brain and so it's very important that we can sense how much oxygen is in the blood to prevent brain damage because the brain is the most important organ in terms of keeping us functional. It controls everything from breathing to heart rate to cognitive function. So we want to make sure that it's getting all the oxygen it needs. Within the corroded arteries, we have the corroded body. And the corroded body has these cells called glomus cells, which detect the levels of carbon dioxide and oxygen in the blood. So these cells relate to the brain, not to the cerebrum, but to the brain stem, which is a more primitive area involved with the unconscious control of breathing and heart rate, stuff like that. So in the brain, we have this area that's receiving input from the corroded artery. And this area then relays a message via the phrenic nerve to our diaphragm. And so the diaphragm is the muscle underneath our lungs that changes our breathing rate. When we breathe in, the diaphragm goes down and when we breathe out 
the diaphragm relaxes and pushes up into our chest, pushing the air up. So we have this whole respiratory neural network that's communicating to make sure we're getting enough oxygen. So what happens if we're in a hypoxic condition? The central nervous system actually becomes more sensitive to the input from the glomus cells. How did we prove this? Well, there was actually a study done in which rats had their corroded body detached from the corroded sinus nerve. So there was no longer input coming from the corroded body in the corroded arteries. And then what the scientists did was stimulate the corroded sinus nerve. And while they stimulated this electrically, they then picked up the signals from the phrenic nerve and measured the output. So what was seen was that animals that had been exposed to hypoxic conditions before this surgery actually had greater phrenic nerve output. With the same input to the corroded body, their phrenic nerve was creating more output. It was more sensitive. It was adjusting the breathing rate more extremely due to the conditions that the rats had been exposed to. Our bodies do this, rats do this, we do this, all mammals do this. If we wore a face mask and had less oxygen, our brain would actually adapt via this ventilatory acclimatization to hypoxia. So if we have chronic hypoxia, we increase the ventilation and we increase the oxygen sensitivity via plasticity in the corroded body and in the central nervous system respiratory centers. So the sensory nerves inside the corroded body become more sensitive and our central nervous system respiratory response regions become more sensitive as well. This is done via a protein called hypoxia inducible factor. And so this actually controls genes for oxygen supply. It controls the expression of the genes and this hypoxia inducible factor is a heterodimer. So it means it's composed of two different units that must bind together to make it functional. If we are in normoxic conditions, the two units don't bind together. But when there's a low amount of oxygen, these two units come together and they can be functional. When the two units of the heterodimer join, they can cause a cascade. It changes the translation of different RNA to proteins and improve our use of oxygen throughout the body. Now, this was shown with chronic hypoxia and it was also shown with chronic intermittent hypoxia. So this would be like in models of individuals that have sleep disorders where perhaps it's sleep apnea and they stop breathing at certain points in the night and so they have a hypoxic episode. They also see this response to the hypoxia in which their brain has plastic changes and it changes their sensitivity to help accommodate for the lack of oxygen. At the end of the day, your brain is amazing and it can adjust to different levels of oxygen in the environment. So whether or not masks are causing a reduction of oxygen, our brain can adapt to it. For people that do have obstructive issues with their airway, it's not recommended that they wear masks. But for healthy individuals, wearing a mask for one hour to go into a store isn't gonna make or break them. If you do feel like you are getting dizzy or lightheaded and you need more air, you can remove your mask. And that's why the CDC says that we can't put masks on individuals that can't take them off. The bottom line is wear a mask, your brain will adjust and you will change your breathing based on the levels of oxygen in the environment. Now, we can't sit there and say, oh yeah, there's 100 milligrams of mercury of oxygen in this air, I'm fine. We don't consciously detect that. Even though that's not happening consciously, our brain is doing it subconsciously and adjusting our breathing to ensure that we get enough oxygen. So wear a mask, do the right thing, help stop the spread of COVID-19. I hope you learned a little bit today about how your brain adjusts to hypoxia. If you have any questions about the episode, leave them down below. If you want to check out the articles that were used, they're in the description. Make sure you like, comment, and subscribe, and stay tuned for new episodes every week. Thanks for joining us again. See you next time.